do expect oil spillage, it's impossible to do this job without spilling any oil. You can see that underneath the car here I've got a metal tray to catch any spillages so you don't contaminate the ground. We start by cleaning around the plug where you're going to drain the oil from, which is this piece here. Don't want any dirt getting in. What I've already done is warm the engine oil up. That'll assist the flow of the oil when it comes out and you can see I've got a container underneath ready to catch the oil. Using a 17mm socket on a short breaker bar, we're just going to undo this nut now. Do expect oil to drip out. Don't panic if you lose the uh, bolt. Now I'm going to leave that there and let it drain I'll get on with some of the other bits. While that's been draining, I've been cleaning the sump plug and preparing a new washer. It is very important to use a new washer. Washers aren't expensive, they're copper washers that are designed to crush into the shape of any imperfections in the metalwork and they do seal it for the sake of a couple of pennies. Always fit a new copper washer. And the washer fits into the recess that the sump plug goes into. So the last thing to do is tighten up the plug and the correct torque is 23 newton meters. Which isn't actually that tight. Now that we've got the oil drained from the engine, there's a couple of things I want to do before moving on to the next stage. The next stage being replacing the centrifuge filter and the full flow filter. This incidentally is the old sump plug washer which is quite deeply grooved so I'm glad we've changed that for the cost of a washer. They're not expensive, do change it. I always keep a pack of spares lying around the garage. Next thing you'll notice is that I'm wearing gloves. Reportedly oil can be carcinogenic and it can cause dermatitis so don't mess around just protect yourself. What I'm doing now is checking a sample of the oil that I've taken out of the engine. One of the things I'm checking for is smell. Is there any indication that diesel is getting into your oil because this can be an early indication of a uh, major fault inside the engine. There's absolutely no smell of diesel in there which is good. The other thing I'm looking for is the texture and colour of the oil. It's a nice black colour because it's been burnt inside the engine but there are no sparkling bits in it. There's no bits of metal in there. I've seen it on a gearbox oil where you do what I'm doing now and you get a sheen of gold coloured specks in it which is where some of the uh, insides of the gearbox is wearing out but this is nice and clean. The other thing I'm looking for is water inside the oil. It's often said that water and oil do not mix but that's not strictly true because inside the environment of an engine with all the heating and moving around of components the oil and the water get, do get mixed together it's called emulsification and it comes out looking a little bit milky a little bit creamy. The creamier it is the more water you've got in there. I'm happy to say that this is nice and water free which is another good thing. So that's it I'm happy that the engine oil is not giving me any indications of engine faults or engine problems. So let's get on with replacing those two filters, the centrifuge filter and the full flow filter. Items 31, 32 and 33 refer to changing the engine oil renewing the centrifuge rotor and renewing the full flow filter.
Now, I had an absolute nightmare with the heat shield. It should be held on by two 7mm bolts and then accessed through this small hole at the back coming directly onto the manifold is a 10mm bolt. As luck would have it, that 10mm bolt was seized and frankly it's taken me longer to get that one bolt off than the entire job should have taken from start to finish. But it's off and here we are. This is the errant bolt. As you can see it's quite badly rounded off and it's very dry. When I put this back in, except it won't be this one, this is going in the bin. When I put the replacement bolt back in I'll be using copper grease on this thread to stop it seizing up again. It's rounded off. I had to douse it in penetrating oil and use one of these which is a gripper socket for getting off damaged bolts and fortunately for me it came off. Worst case scenario is breaking the head of the bolt off even the stud part stuck in the uh, manifold. However, I was lucky it came off. The next option would have been to apply some heat with a blowtorch and failing that I'd have tried welding a larger bolt onto the top of this and trying to spanner it off with that larger bolt. You can just about see the full flow filter there. It's the white thing towards the middle of the picture. It's accessible through the back of the manifold itself here. That's the access point and that's why you need to take the heat shield off. When you put it back on, you do need to put a thin smear of oil on the new seal and tighten it hand tight and then do your best to tighten it a quarter of a turn further. Must stress, you should only do this by hand, don't use tools. Item 47 on the official Land Rover schedule is to check all of your pipe work and all of your electrical harnesses, the wiring for chaffing and weak spots. I tend to do this as I go around the car rather than leaving it all for one big hit and you can see here in the dark the protective sleeving for this wire has gone so I'm going to be very shortly replacing that protective sleeving. Another thing I like to do while I'm in this part of the engine is check the manifold, the exhaust manifold. Looking at these studs in here, is there any sign of leakage? Have you got soot marks coming out of any of the fixing points? Because if you have that's an indication that your uh, manifold may be warped and generally that can be a pig of a job because the bolts tend to snap off as well but uh, I'm happy to say this is a re-skimmed manifold so it's already warped and then being flattened out so it shouldn't warp a second time and it's looking good. Another feature underneath your heat shield is the wastegate actuator which is this little beauty here. Unless you've got problems with your engine running don't adjust this but what I do like to do is just make sure that's on there firmly and just check that nothing's about to fall off it's all looking good there's no indication that anything's seized up it's quite stiff so you won't be able to push it manually unless you use tools but as I say unless you've you know you've got problems I wouldn't fudge around with that at all so I've done the full flow filter next is the centrifuge filter which is under this domed cap here this little thing here which is only held on, the cap is only held on by two bolts I've removed the crank house breather pipe and tucked it away to one side just to give myself some room we're looking at this bolt here and this bolt here they're both 10mm I'm going to gently undo those now to release the cover Now with the bolts undone, this cover should just gently lift off. It's not actually attached anymore but it's a tight squeeze, leaving the rotor itself exposed. So now I'm going to take the uh, rotor out, grab it by the top and lift straight up off of the spindle. And there it comes. Alright, so it should be nice and clean now. So you've got a decent seating for the seal. 
This is the cap. As you can see, there's a seal around here. Your new filter will come with a new seal, so that can be discarded. And again, this needs a clean. So this is the new rotor. Inside the box comes a new o-ring. The old o-ring looked to be in very good condition but regardless I'm going to change it. This just slips around the inside of the cap. It goes on the top. It sits on there firmly. The only thing you've got to do is make sure it doesn't drop off when you uh, put it back on. The rotor itself, you can see there's a hole through the middle. That is just going to plop straight back on that spindle that you took the old one off of. So here we go with the new rotor, plops straight on there and sits down. Now we're ready to put the cap back on. Before I do I just want to draw your attention to this little marking here on the cover which says lever. That corresponds to a notch underneath the lip of the cover that you could get a lever underneath to pull the top off if it's jammed on. I've never had to use it. Alright, so that's the top back on. Now very very important, probably the most important part of this job to remember and get right, is to use a torque wrench. Once again you're screwing steel bolts into an alloy body. If you strip the thread out of the uh, centrifuge body you're making a lot of work for yourself because it's not an easy job to replace and I think they're about 300 pounds a shot, the uh, bodies. So use a torque wrench and the setting is 10 newton meters. Stress again, don't over tighten these bolts, you'll uh, land yourself in a world of plop. With both filters now in place and the drain plug secured, we're going to refill the engine oil. I'll be using grade 5W30 for this and you'll need 7.2 litres. Now, I spoke in part one about using different grade oils for different climates. At the moment, we're back in the UK, so I'll be using 5W30 grade oil, which is the right grade oil for the UK climate. The first six litres of oil have gone straight in, no problem. The last 1.2 litres are going to go in a bit more slowly as you do not want to overfill your engine. If you put too much oil in, you have to take it out because you can get problems with too much pressure in there. And believe it or not, if you put too much oil in there, you can actually create resistance against some of the components and damage the internals of your engine. It's designed to run with a certain amount of oil, not too much, not too little. If you do overfill it, then probably the easiest way to take some out is with a syringe and pipe or a little handheld pump of some sort. When you put the oil back in it's advisable to do so with the dipstick out which assists just that little bit by giving somewhere for the air to escape but you do need to make sure you make regular level checks as you get closer and closer to capacity. This can be time consuming because you do need to let the oil settle down before using the dipstick so it's not something that you can rush. This one is exactly where I want it to be up to the top notch on the dipstick so all that's left for me to do now is put the acoustic cover back on and the heat shield back on. Finally I will take it for a quick test drive to make sure that it's not leaking from any of the bits that I've worked on and a final top up of oil if needed. If that all checks out then it's finished and that's the oil change done. 
travelling around the car, checking all the pipes and everything, you have to have a look underneath. This metal pipe here is one to check. There's a short metal U section between some rubber hoses and it tends to rub on the bottom of the engine and wear through the hose. Really easy fix is to, I don't know if you can see there's not a lot of light, cable tie some uh, rubber around the vulnerable part of the pipe that just stops that rubbing. Now I'm looking at the steering box, checking for leaks. This is the uh, AdWest steering box. It's nice and dry here, which is good. This is the drop arm. You quite often get leaks from the sector shaft around here, which will show up on this nut as a wetness. This one's nice and dry, which is good. Item number 51 on the service schedule, slowly getting through the list here, is checking the steering box mountings. Now the AdWest steering box fits to the chassis with four bolts which are up here. One, two, three, four and they should be at 90 newton meters. Let's give them a little bit of time. Oh, I didn't expect that. There's quite a bit of movement on there. It shows it's worth checking these. Didn't expect that at all. Get on there. Last one. Wow. And that highlights how important it is to check these things. Item 45 on the service schedule is checking your ACE actuators front and rear. This is the rear ACE actuator. The gators are in good condition, the bushes are in good condition. I don't know how well it's going to show up on the film but I have got some wetness here which suggests a very small pinhole leak somewhere in this hose. So this hose has to be replaced. If you're using the original Land Rover components unfortunately you have to buy the hose complete with the pipes it gets a bit expensive but you can get hydraulic pipes on their own fitted to the metal pipes with compression fittings which is what I'm going to be doing. I've already done the rear one, now checking the front one. We're checking the connections for the hydraulics. These are nice and dry, there's no sign of any leakage. We're also checking the condition of these gaiters. That one's good. You can buy the gaiters separately on their own, so if they have gone, you only need to replace the gaiter, not the whole thing. Now, this has had it. The bush at the bottom here is totally worn, and as you can see, there's a lot of play in there. That shouldn't be like that at all. So, I'm going to have to replace the front bush. The back one was fine. Still with the ACE system, this is the ACE valve block. Now, I don't know if you can see that, a drop of red ACE fluid. Typically, these develop leaks at the shoulder of the pipe inside where the collet holds it into the valve block. I know about this leak and I'm all geared up to replace it. I've already done a bush repair, you can see where I've taken a section out welded the hole shut this was a bush repair and then put it back but what I didn't have at the time was a fresh seal so although the pipe itself has had the hole welded shut the seals don't take kindly to interference and I now think the seals leaking but the whole lot's going to be replaced that's uh, a big job I'll be doing shortly 
one of the items on the service schedule is replacing the ACE filter. I won't be doing that myself because I'm replacing the whole valve block. But uh, basically the filter is housed in here. You undo this, remove the filter, slot the new one back in and redo it up again. Item number five on the Land Rover service schedule is replacing the batteries in the key handsets. Land Rover reckon this should be done every three years. If you don't replace them that frequently, there are two signs that you can get that they need doing. One is a reduced performance from the keys. You might find yourself having to hold them a lot closer to the vehicle to get them to work. And the other one is a fast flashing of the alarm LED on the dashboard, which is the little red one in the centre of the dashboard. Basically, if it's detecting that the batteries are getting too low, it will flash rapidly for 10 seconds after you've closed the door. So basically, you'll jump in the car, sit down, and realise that you've got a fast flashing light. Not everybody knows what that light is telling them. One of the main reasons to keep on top of changing the battery is that if the battery fails, the key will fail to communicate with the vehicle immobiliser and you can find yourself unable to get into the car and start the engine without using a thing called an EKA, which is an emergency key access code. If you look inside your driver's handbook, that will tell you how to use the EKA. And if you haven't got an EKA code, you need to get hold of your Land Rover dealer and ask them to supply you with one because you won't want to be stranded without knowing your EKA code. Some people memorise their code, some people have, have the code written down somewhere, but don't leave it inside your vehicle. Right, so how do we change the batteries? You start by prising the case open with a large flat bladed screwdriver. If you use a small flat bladed screwdriver you can end up denting and damaging the plastic case. Once you've got the end undone, slide the screwdriver around the edges and that will complete the process of removing the back. I've already done that one. Now, you can see mine were replaced in November 2018. It's now January 2021, so not quite three years old, but they have had a lot of use. To get the batteries out, you need to just to get the batteries out. You need to just pull back the little plastic tab where my thumb is, and then they should pop out like that. Okay, so I'll do that again. To get them out, you just have to move the little black tab where my thumb is, and then lever them out. Now. Depending on which version of the handbook you've got, which will depend on which country you're in, the instructions either tell you to hold the key down to discharge the capacitor, or they don't. I'm going to hold any key down for a count of five. There's one, two, three, four, five. I don't know how important that is. It can't be terribly important because not all of the handbooks tell you to do that. Just in some territories they do. One, two, three, four, five. A capacitor is a small electrical component that stores voltage uh, and by pressing the button you just clear the voltage. So I'm now going to just stick the new batteries in. With the new batteries you have to be careful not to put grease from your fingers on the contacts because that can uh, affect the performance of the battery, which is very difficult when they stick stickers on them. So I'm going to give mine a little clean. Okay, it just pushes against the spring and then down. Right, just needs a firm press and that's in. It should have a red light when I press it, there it goes. So it's functioning. And the same with the other one. Right. 
I understand why they put these stickers on, but it does create a bit of a problem when you're trying not to put fingerprints on the batteries. Okay, I'm not, I don't worry about fingerprints on this surface because that's not a contact surface. The contact surface is on the underside and around the edge. Once they're on, all I do is put the date on just to help me keep track. So it's Jan 2021. You don't need to do that, it's just me being uh, pedantic. Uh, what else is there? Oh, yeah, the batteries are CR2032, that's the battery size. The Land Rover manual recommends a certain brand, but uh, as long as you don't get a really cheap one, I don't think the brand is particularly important. Last thing to do is just firmly press the casing back on. That's that. Oh, just as an aside, if you do ever find yourself having to change your lock sets, uh, which will come with new keys, you don't need to panic about getting your new keys reprogrammed because this whole circuit board will lift out of your old key and plop straight back into your new key and it's already in tune so to speak with your car so you don't need to reprogram your car which is quite useful and I, I know this for a fact because these keys are my second set and yet the printed circuit board is still the original one from when the car was new. And that's it, don't need to think about doing that for another three years.